This is People I Know Show, a podcast about interesting people, personal growth, and being wrong. I'm your host, Kurt Karstensen. Today's guest is Vina Chalice. Vina is someone I've begun to know in recent months. She's an Asian American that grew up both in the United States and in a few different parts of Asia. We discussed her unusual upbringing and what she learned from it. We talk about a couple concepts and influences that she has had on my life, as well as a few other topics, including the Being Wrong segment. Check the show notes for the websites discussed in today's episode, and you can like or follow People I Know Show on both Facebook and Instagram. There you'll see a photo of us, as well as be able to stay in touch with content regarding future episodes. Now, into the conversation with Vina Chalice. I'm joined today by Vina Chalice. Hello, Vina. Hi, how's it going, Kurt? It's going good. Vina, you are on People I Know show, and you're one of my more recent friends, acquaintances. I don't know how we, we establish that word, but I do know we haven't known each other that long, but I met you in one of the more random ways, and pretty quickly we started becoming friends. Do you remember how we met and why 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 things took off so quickly? You were my Uber driver and I had just finished a happy hour over at Pat's Tap and it was really there was a lot of traffic and uh when I went into your car I noticed that you had a really cool um hand bracelet. I do so I have this bracelet. <laughs> <laughs> that says live your core and you're still wearing it today well, no, actually that one broke and i got another one i got the hookup as those of you that listened to episode two of the podcast i had my brother chuck karstensen on and we talked about the core strength experience but from that i got this wristband and i i find it interesting some people occasionally ask me about it it's fairly prominent where i'm surprised how infrequently other people ask me about it because i think i would ask people about their wristbands but Vina, I think of all the people who has ever asked me about the wristband, it was within, I swear, within the first second that I knew you existed as you got into my car, you asked me about it immediately, which was kind of cool. But it started a conversation and we, we were only in the car for like seven or 10 minutes. But then it, we decided to exchange contact information. We became friends there to hang out a little bit and did some cool things, at least especially in the, the first few weeks that we knew each other. Exactly. And I don't notice... Like I noticed his bracelet because not a lot of men wear jewelry, to be honest. And since my my partner, my husband in training, he's a jeweler, I usually notice when men wear bracelets or if they're wearing something neat and I, I want to start a conversation and learn more. Also, it had a very empowering message. And I am all for personal development and improving yourself and challenging yourself. And Kurt is all about that, too. And that's what the podcast is about, at least in part. So that's why I thought you would be a good person to have on the program. And yes, my bracelet, although it has a good message. It, when you talk about jewelry, I, I, I <laughs> picture like diamonds and and pearls and this thing. It doesn't have that type of a flair on it, but it does It does have a good message that I'm, I'm, I'm occasionally able to pass on to those that ask. So Vina... What I find interesting about you, um, among many things, is, okay, so we met, but we met because you were back in the United States after being gone a while, and you don't drive that much, or maybe didn't drive at all at that time, so that's why you're getting into new, besides a happy hour idea as well. <laughs> but talk about, um, and explain this to me, I, I know we've talked about it a little bit, but you you've, were gone for some time, even though you were born in this country. So... I'm not the typical American. And the reason being that is because I lived in Asia for a good part of my life. And on top of that, I happened to live in Thailand. So I was living in a beach town and frankly, I drove motorcycles. And coming back to Minnesota, you have to drive a car. Over in Asia, transportation is super convenient. Um, everyone can get by just by walking, by taking the bus, by taking the metro, whereas here in America, um, if you're not in Chicago or New York, you have to learn how to drive a car. And for some reason, I was terrified of driving a car. I felt more comfortable driving a motorcycle. 
And how is the driving the car process coming along for you in, in the, the recent months? Oh, that's fine. It's, it's completely fine now. Um, I don't think Minnesotas are that crazy of drivers. Well, I haven't compared it with anywhere else, <laughs> at least. Tell me about the, the, the years in, in Asia. You talk about living on beach houses and driving motorcycles. <laughs> why, why were you doing those things? How, how did that all come about? Hmm. So I am a huge traveler and a free spirit. So when I was living... Before Thailand, I was living in Shanghai in China, and that is so crowded. It's such an overpopulated country, um, China, for the for the most part. And um, the work life, there there was no balance. You would finish work at probably 7.30 and then go out for drinks and then, you know, come home around 10 and start your day again. And I wanted an escape. I wanted a way out where I could relax and take a break. And Thailand came through because my friend invited me to an internship at the Westin Hotel in Phuket. And the great arrangement about that was that I had my own um, beach view room <laughs> Um, in return for for working. And that's when I realized that there is another way of living. There's another way of existing and people have completely like have completely different ideas of time and uh, and work life balance as well. But you don't have that right now. But that's at least not the same way. Well, moving back to America, I also wasn't ready to dive into corporate America because of the lifestyle I had in Thailand. So I found ways where I could work. Um, I I do freelancing online. I I write. I also dog sit. I'm a fairy dog mother, and I'm pretty good at it. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, life is good. Did you come up with the term fairy dog mother? Yes. <laughs> I am one. <laughs> I like it. Remind me how many years it was that you were living away from the United States before coming back. So that was 2005. 2005 until about what, 2016, 2017? 2016. And did you come back to the U.S. during that entire time at all? Uh, I came back to visit, but okay. it wasn't for more than maybe two weeks. And if I did come back, it was just for my job, for work. And you're still fairly young. So some of your... <laughs> How old do you think I am? I forgot. I don't know. You can tell me if you want to. Uh, I'm 29. So is that pretty young? I think that's young. Okay. And you get to be 29 so forever. Like, so it's... So How old are you? <laughs> 35. God, you're so old. Just yeah, kidding. I know. Okay. So you were gone... From the bulk of your 20s and your late teens. So that means you grew up, what was it, California? You grew up initially? I initially grew up in California. So you can tell by my accent. And then I moved to Hong Kong. And I also lived in Shanghai, China. And then different parts of Thailand. What's, what's, what are some of the big differences living in these different places? What, what did the, you learn about yourself and, you know, in addition to when you realize that it was an option to not work the way a lot of people in this world work by the opportunities you had in Thailand, what else have you have you found from all these different life experiences? Because I, I think maybe it's as an individual, I think we all have our own life and we think that's kind of normal, even though it might not be normal. Right, but right. I think to the average person that might be listening to our conversation, living in California and several different cities throughout Asia and the, you know, the youthful years of your life, that's, you get an opportunity to learn a lot of things that most of us don't get to learn. Really? I never thought about it that way. The biggest things I learned in terms of like work life um, is in China and in Thailand is that relationships matter a lot. Um, and what that means is that you have to develop an ongoing relationship with everyone um, 
with the people you know and the network you have, that is a lot more important than um, the work itself. Because there is something in Chinese culture called ranching and it's called human currency. I, I don't know if that makes sense, but there are things that in, in terms of work and in terms of doing business and negotiations, um, sometimes it's it's people, the reason why people decide to work together is not necessarily because of money, but it's also because of uh, relationships and because you can trust one another. And through that, I was able to, you know, um, get more jobs and different projects and um, a lot of really creative. I had a lot of really creative and exciting projects I got to work on. And I had a lot of very um, fun opportunities as well. So I can give you an example. Um, did you know I was on MTV, Kurt? I don't know if I know that you were on MTV. Okay, so I was on MTV. And MTV International, they invited me and two of my friends to travel China and go on a road trip on a Volkswagen Beetle around Shanghai and the the neighboring cities there. And it was part of their promotions for uh, the World Stage concert. So I don't know if you used to watch MTV or if you still do. Way back in the day. But they do have World Stage concerts in different parts of the world, like in New York and Berlin and Shanghai. So I was invited to literally go on a road trip and do silly activities in order to win backstage passes to see Maroon 5. So does this mean you were famous at that time? Was this like, kind of like a really big deal or kind of a big deal or no, not that big of a deal? It, I thought it was really fun. <laughs> and I mean, um, it was a great opportunity and I was lucky because of, um, you know, the friendships I cultivated and, and the network I had to to be selected so that was just one of the fun creative projects i had and how is it that you think you were selected over anybody else that might have wanted to get that opportunity what, have, what makes you stand out there for instance i have no idea i really don't have any idea okay <laughs> i think that's interesting though because i think a lot of people can see in us Sometimes what we don't see in ourselves. So clearly someone, at least one person or several people thought that you would be a good person for this. But you sitting here today don't know why that would have been. I mean, do you see why? <laughs> I think so. I mean, you're adventurous and you're easy to talk to and like not afraid of pretty much anything, I don't think. So maybe that sh shine through a little bit. I don't know. I also, I would also say that I haven't open mind and I stay open to opportunities like that. For the most part, it just falls on my radar. Anything that's exciting and um, fun and lifts me up and rather than thinking through the, you know, like worries like, oh, what if I didn't get chosen and should I even try? I, I, I'm more of a, you know, dive in first and think later type of person <laughs> and i'm historically a, a think first dive in later although i've i've had as uh I, my first episode with my friend george he's he's helped me get out of that a little bit but i i understand i that people can totally approach these things differently yeah so like winter in minnesota is really cold and i set an intention that this year i would be more active so for the last two days I got my bike fixed and I've just been riding my bicycle around town without really thinking of how many layers I should wear <laughs> or if I had the proper shoes or anything. And how did that work out for you? It was wonderful for the first eight minutes and then my Google Maps died and I got lost and I got terribly cold. <laughs> And then I found the fabulous noodles and company to purchase a chicken noodle soup to warm myself up. And I and 
I asked a lovely old lady if I could borrow her phone so someone could pick me up in the bike and <laughs> take me home. This does not sound like 2018 <laughs> anymore. Are you sure this was yesterday or the day before? Yes, this is yesterday and I am 29. <laughs> okay. So the lovely old lady had a had a cell phone for you. It's a good thing. Yep. People are sweet here. Before we totally get away from the, the subject of your living experiences, I still think it's fascinating. You you have like cross-cultural backgrounds and if you're willing to get into that so your parents aren't from the same country and yet you grew up in a third country is that right so you grew up in the united states initially but your parents neither one of them was from the united states or the same country so my mother is taiwanese and my father's from hong kong and then um my family they're uc berkeley graduates so the reason why I ended up in China for school is because my parents wanted to make sure that I understood my Asian heritage a little better because they had to learn how to adapt to living in America and they wanted to make sure I could not lose my roots. And they made that decision for you. Yes. And now that the decision's in the past, and you can look back on it if you look back at it, which maybe I look back on things more than you do. Uh, what what do you think of it? Was that the right decision to send you to study there? I could say that when I first moved to Asia, I was experiencing cultural culture shock only because I grew up envisioning what my life would look like in California. I was the typical Cali girl. So <laughs> moving to Asia where I didn't completely speak the language, I didn't completely understand the culture and I was leaving my friends and family behind was hard. It was pretty difficult at first, but I could say that it also opened my mind to new ways of living. And I am the person I am today because I got to experience a taste of different cultures. And that encouraged me to want to travel more, want to see the world more, want to meet people and learn their stories and learn their languages and and why and 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 get curious on how people move through this world. Would you describe your life growing up in the United States to be pretty easy or was it was it a difficult upbringing? I guess in the sense that it sounds like when you first arrived to is it China is where you went initially? Hong Kong. Hong Kong. Which is now part of China. Now part of China. And they're they're equally con- Hong Kong people are equally confused right now. <laughs> yeah, so it used to be part of Great Britain? Yep. Okay, so yeah, I know continually just there's probably identity crises crises i think we are all having identity crisis right now (laughs) but i I guess the question then you had this what was normal to you growing up in california and then based on this decision to find out more of where you came from and get an understanding of the culture there you were an outsider and you had to figure a lot of things out is what it sounds like Yes. And so your relatively easy life, perhaps, if it was easy, became much more difficult very quickly. It became much more difficult really quickly. In (laughs) California, I lived in the suburbs. In Hong Kong, I lived in the city. My stepmom is also a movie star in Hong Kong. So that made it a little bit more unsettling for me to, to adjust to... Um, a, a different lifestyle where when I was living in California, I just saw her as my stepmom. Where And then when I moved to Hong Kong, you know, she, I had to be a little bit more um, aware of who I was and, um, and how I am going to be perceived by the public. And it was hard for me because I was a lot more Chinese American than I was, um, as a, as someone that's from Hong Kong. Did people know that she was your stepmother and did you have to deal with that like directly, or is this just something that you had in your mind because it was more prominently in front of you? 
It was something that I had to deal with because everyone knew who she was. And in Hong Kong, or if you are living in the city, you go out more. You don't eat at home. You go out more. There is a lot more activities. There's a lot more functions and um, events to to go to. And I had to be a part of that growing up at, when I was, what, 13, 14? So you needed to go to these very public events with a celebrity who you were living with. Or just day-to-day life where people recognized her. And they recognized her and then you were with her and then it just became your life then. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. <laughs> Outside of that, that city, would people recognize her? Like how big of a star? In China, she was quite well known. Yes. Did that play into your MTV opportunity? No, I keep my life kind of separate. And I don't know if people really think about that. If, you know, if, you know, we love the gossip of celebrities, their life and their home life and everything. And if you think about the children, either they're part of it or they kind of want to figure out their own path. And um, while while my family didn't have a huge influence on me necessarily, uh, what the experience taught me was to figure out how to discover my own identity separate from um, my parents separate from my stepmom and separate from the the life that they had intended. How is it that you you found your own identity living in this place that was relatively new to you with famous people around you and this some of these things that maybe could have drawn you in but you seem to have gone a different direction? I think it's culture. Um also I wasn't too interested I, I because I was you know I grew up with Spice Girls and Sing Backstreet Boys forgive me um, I was a lot more interested in in more of the American Hollywood pop stars just as a teen than I was in in Hong Kong or in China where I didn't regularly watch um, movies there. I didn't regularly listen to Chinese music. I started to, but because I didn't uh, necessarily grow up, um, you know, really falling in love or I- admiring the culture necessarily, even though I am Chinese, uh, it didn't have the same effect on me. I really wanted to learn how to just adapt. Or I also really missed living in California at the time. Remember, I I was a child. I was a teen. Trying and as a teen, you're just trying to figure out who you are in in this world. And you were just starting to figure it out in California, and then you got dropped elsewhere on the planet. Yeah, and you didn't fit in. Yeah, I don't think it, I did, did fit in. You think other people recognize that you didn't fit in? Of course, of course. Um, because I didn't have the same upbringing at all. So it's obvious right away and to someone from the, there. And also the, yeah, the education is completely different. Uh, the things that people talk about, very different. Um, the way friends hang out. And it's just, it's all, it's completely different. 13-year-old girls in the United States, I think, are all about just trying to fit in. And you probably got to be pretty good at that. And then suddenly you're in a new place and you don't fit in and you don't know what to do. A little bit like that. Yeah. So what what then did you do? Nothing too productive. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I did, you know, I I never really shared this, but I am pretty glad for the internet because beside because the internet uh brought me to this personal development forum. One, I, it's it's gone now, but it's Steve Pavlina. And then there is another forum called E Not Alone. 
And that was my opportunity to really try to figure out how I can adjust with moving and with feeling alone uh, after the move. And how did you get out of this alone feel? How, did it take a long time? And how did you get out of it? There was support from other people in this world. Online support. Yeah, they didn't know who I was. They didn't know I was like an Asian girl, like <laughs> with celebrity parents or anything. But if there's anything about human beings, they can connect with emotions. They can, you know, we have a high capacity to empathize and and know what it's like to feel confused and to feel scared and and not or depressed and not sure where to go or what to do. We have a high capacity to empathize and what these random strangers on the internet did for me was just that. I, like, and I would assume that a lot of them were a lot of, they, they had, everyone was probably a different age or ethnicity or they were in a different situation and they were in different places like all over the world and they were, everyone was just trying to figure things out and help one another in an anonymous platform. I find a reason why I think I wanted to have a podcast is because I look back at my life and it has not been difficult, I don't think, but then compared to somebody else's life, I don't really know. But I do know that I would go through these internal mental struggles and I think everybody does to a certain degree. Some people, maybe it's it consumes your whole life and just some aspect of life for a few years. But we all, I think, can relate to this. This is like the the unspoken truth of our existence <laughs> that we, unless we have really good support around us, we go through a stretch of our life thinking we're we're like all alone in some area. And the longer we stay there, the longer we struggle. But then once we realize if we meet different people in whatever ways and they can relate to our struggle, our struggle is not that big of a deal anymore. And it just begins to fade away. Maybe it's a, a long process to get rid of it, whatever it is that we're dealing with. But I feel like we all have that in some way. And you maybe had this first crisis or one of them that you speak of now when you, when you showed up in Hong Kong and were alone in this place with a ton of people. It was confusing, but I definitely feel like, you know, despite my circumstances, despite the fact that I had a stepmom as a celebrity, despite the fact that, um, you know, where, where life took me is probably very unique compared to like, it's, it's unique, but I feel like everyone else has their own unique stories and we can all relate to, struggles and feeling alone at whatever age um, and stage we are in. And that's why I'm very thankful for uh, people in general, for anyone that cares to to listen or cares to to help another person on on their journey to improving themselves and to to believing in themselves and um, to feeling confident that they can, you know, make their day better. And coming out of this aloneness, this loneliness, did things in get progressively better through the years that you lived? Absolutely. Absolutely. I was able to find my ground and I was able to make friends. You know, we always need friends, <laughs> no matter what, um, but also understand myself better and uh, take get her, like be a lot more compassionate and understanding of myself and how, yeah, my life changed completely. And it it was a it was a big move for me. As a little girl. And now you're back in the United States yep. for some time. And But <laughs> these things you've learned about yourself yeah. are now applying to how you're spending your time and trying to continue to grow and, and to help other people, I imagine. Is, is that is that what's happened? Now that I think of it, um, correct. So I do work for a company. It's a startup specifically for... 
helping people with their well-being, with having tools that uh, they could use and apply for their mental, physical, emotional, or spiritual journey. And that platform is called Healing Clouds. And they connect holistic health and alternative healing practitioners with clients from all over the world through online video call. How did you get into the holistic and why do you think it's effective? I personally think it's effective because I see the mind, body, spirit connection a lot more clearly. Um, If you are, if you do experience illness or chronic pain, it didn't just get there necessarily through diet. It also got there through stress. It got there through the way you feel and think about yourself, um, about your reality, because that does something to your body that creates more cortisol levels, that creates more inflammation in your body. If you learn tools and techniques to teach you how to relax, if you learn um, different ways of thinking that can help you... um, help you manage your emotions or or see life through a more uh, positive and empowering lens, it does have an effect on your physiology. It does have an effect on your stress levels and it does have an effect on your physical health. How's your stress levels and your physical health at this point? <laughs> it's pretty good. I mean, I just went out for a bike ride also when I, when I do uh, feel stress because, oh, by the way, um, this week is stress awareness week. And what should we do with the information that it's stress awareness? How, how do we come? <laughs> so besides the title, stress awareness, what does that mean to me or to anybody? Is for you to become more aware of how stress is affecting your body, your well-being, and also know that there are ways where you can manage it better that you don't have to live a certain way where you're always stressed out and where you can't think properly where you feel fatigue where you feel like everyone is stressing you out and where you feel like there is no way for you to learn how to relax and learn how to find peace and calm within yourself without any other external resource. So if someone is listening to our conversation and they feel maximum stress or about as stressed as they ever would ever want to feel, what's what's the first step that you'd suggest to somebody? Breathe. Whoever, if you have any friends that remind you to breathe and take deep breaths, then they are like keepers. <laughs> because what breathing essentially does, breathing deeply, it slows down your um, your highly activated states. It slows things down. It allows your body to relax when your body is relaxed and your um, amygdala isn't on fight or flight mode, then you're able to see things a lot more clearly. You're able to feel more in control of yourself and move from a place that is not reactive, but move from a place of peace and a place of calm and a place of clarity. Have you seen or demonstrate it or had someone do this in front of you and just seen the stress dissolve away quickly? Like you've seen this in practice work for others? Yes. There are two demonstrations that in which I've seen this happen. Um, one is through hypnosis. And then two is through EFT. It's called, it's called emotional freedom technique. And what does that mean? What, what, what happens then? For which one? The EFT. So... Emotional freedom technique basically 
um, taps into different physiological meridian points that you have on your body. And what essentially that does it is that it recirculates. Let's say, let's say you have anxiety, right? So what you can do is you can tap with your hands, like different parts of your body. Um, it could be the top of your head, your collarbone, the side of your palm, and you don't need any drugs for that. And then it will significantly significantly reduce your stress levels. It tells your body to rewire and recirculate your stressful emotions and it finds a way to to help it leave your body. I don't know if I... Well, I think so. Is this kind of like the... Would it be like, is it Pavlov's dogs where your body, you train your body to respond to these spots to react in a different way, a way that you want? That's hypnosis. Already, that's so that, hypnosis. That's hypnosis. So what hypnosis does is hypnosis creates a, su- a suggestion, a suggestion in a sense that it can, it makes you more suggestible to feeling calm and less stressful um, because your body hasn't necessarily, is more trained to feel stress than it is to train to feel relaxed. Does that make sense? Yes. Right? For sure. So hypnosis, what it does is it puts you in a relaxed state where your subconscious is open to having a conversation. And through there, you can create suggestions such as experiencing relaxation and happiness and and joy. And then you can anchor that to, uh, you can anchor that to a physical response, whether it's like, you know, pulling your ear or clasping your, your hands together so that every time you clasp your hands together, you remember what it feels like to feel calm and what it feels like to to feel relaxed. It's it's just like your your cue for I've that. Seen, I've seen people hypnotize. In fact, at the the core strength experience, there are some people involved with that that do this. In fact, I think my nephews have learned some of these techniques. So I've seen it, and I maybe I've participated a little bit. I don't know that I've had the great impact from it. Other people might have, but as a skeptic, I'm. I believe that it can work, but I'm also I like to, to really experience it for myself before I'm I'm convinced of anything. I'm not suggesting that we do this right now, but <laughs> I, I'm, I I like I like that there are ways that other people have found to feel better because that's really what I'm all about is what what in your life can make you feel better and how do we get more of it? Yeah, and yeah. You, you seem to have found things that you are on board with and think there are. Yeah, you think it have been effective for you or for others you've seen. Yeah, well, um, I actually did a Facebook Live on this last week. Uh, and you can actually watch one of the hypnotherapists on Healing Class actually um, demonstrate what a hypnosis session would be like. Then I will put that into my show notes for this episode <laughs> and make sure that anyone that wants to see it can have an easy access to yeah. watch that. And the the other tool I talked about was EFT. Have you ever seen that happen? Or have you ever experienced that? I think maybe, I forget the name of it, but a few years ago I, I participated in something that sounds very familiar to this. It didn't seem to work on me as well as it worked on other people. Maybe mm. it's because I don't allow it to because I'm... I'm very aware of what's going on around me and maybe I'm not a good subject for these things, but I, I do think other people benefit from it. Have, have get more benefit and maybe I could learn to get more benefit. So perhaps, is there also a Facebook Live demonstrating that? Yes, I'm going to be a host for that again. Um, and it's this Friday oh. as well. So that will end up in the show notes as well. I'll make sure I'll make sure that <laughs> anyone listening to this can access these videos and it's probably better than I mean, you can explain it, but you've explained it, but I think it's better to see some of these things happen. Yes. Than I, just listening to us talk about it. Absolutely. Absolutely. Here's something that we can perhaps talk about and you get a demonstration is I'm I'm not necessarily very I'm not religious and I'm not sure that I'm even spiritual. But one of the first times we met, you brought with you tarot cards 
Is that what you call them? Oracle cards. Oracle cards. Or tarot cards. Sure. Why not? Oracle cards, which to me, there wasn't a difference. But explain what the difference would be between those two words. Um, I guess for tarot cards, it's a lot more traditional um, for people that are, I guess, what you would call them intuitive or psychic readers uh, that could show you your future and what it may hold. The way I look at oracle cards are oracle cards, they're not necessarily from the same, um, they're not the same kind of deck of cards as tarot, but they have different symbolisms and pictures associated with different meanings and everything. And how I use it pretty much is a tool to help me understand my psyche better and observe how the cards rhyme with my current situation, like in terms of themes um, that are in my life and um, give me greater insight to where I want to go. Does that make any sense to you? I think so. Can we do a demonstration here? Would this work? Vina didn't have her cards with her, but she can access through the internet a comparable deck yeah. So we're going to do this. And me being the ultra skeptic, the first time we did this, I was kind of surprised how relatable the three cards I ended up with were to my life and how kind of unrelatable all the other ones in the deck as I looked through them, like those were the best three cards I thought. How did that happen? So I don't know. It might have just been a coincidence, but let's let's try it again it's here. Always, it's, it can be a coincidence, but it's, I think... The way our minds work is that we're very open to symbolism and we're very we're also very curious to understanding how something can relate to our own experience in our own lives. So whatever cards you choose, I feel like if you're open to gaining deeper insight and trying to see how that rhymes with you, then it can help you. Okay. Let's start with the second one from the right. Second one from the right. And we have to do three of them, correct? Yep. Um, let's scroll to the left and then the one that pops up on the end after the next click. So that one okay. feels pretty random, I yeah, suppose. So, it's, so this card is past, present, future. You got to pick one more. One more. The one uh, second from the right now. This one that's scrolling away in the middle. This there one? There we go. Yep. Okay. Past, present, and future. Okay. So the first question was where is this going and the deck you card you pulled out is called spirit of place authenticity is the essence of power don't get entangled in details or desires that obscure the truth of your situation step back and ask yourself what is the real nature of my inquiry even exquisitely seductive hidden agendas cannot conceal this Trust your intuition, the spirit of places whispering in your ear. You hold the power to tell the truth, first to yourself, then to the world. You can always distinguish between an essence that is true and one that is synth synthetic. Be honest with yourself and remain willing to let your situation be revealed for what it really is and not what you want it to be. An apple cannot become an orange, just as the dog can never be a bird. Are you trying to change someone or something to suit your agenda? Only when you see things as they truly are will you find the treasure, the real treasures. So what should I do with that one? Where is this going? That, that's the question? Yeah, so that's so it's past, present. Each card is representation of the past, present, and future and the themes that themes of your life or what you make of it, really. Yeah, it's okay. So I can, as you were reading that, I feel like that speaks of this podcast in my my need, desire to be honest and not hide anything, not try to be synthetic and just let it happen, be honest with myself and put it out to people so that I can relate to it and maybe someone else could read the same thing and relate to it as well. Differently, yeah. Okay. See, oracle cards, they like in tarot cards, they don't really, they're, they're not here to like really tell you your future and how things are going to be. They're here for you to gain more introspection and insight to yourself and how you choose to, you know, receive the information and analyze it and apply it to your own truth is essentially how I read it. You know, 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, but what I love about these cards is that it can be pretty, you know, generalized. It's not completely specific, but there there is always some sort of resonance that I see with it. Okay. okay. Do we now go to the second one? Yeah. See, it's not too woo-woo. No. <laughs> so what else do I need to know? The theme is Stormfields. This too shall pass. So this is what it's saying for your present time. Now is not the time to engage in any activity that brings unwanted chaos or drama into your life. This kind of storm can be destructive and you'll regret your actions later. Hurtful words will be carried on in the wind and bring a tornado of betrayal, anger, and unnecessary angst. Find shelter. This turbulent weather will pass and your house will be untouched. Say no to drama. Wait till the storm blows over. Only then will you be heard. So I can just imagine anyone could read the same card I and come up with their smiling. own, their own answer. Like, oh my but right gosh, away, I can't believe she just said that. Right away, <laughs> what I immediately related to that is why I've chosen to and I'm kind of trying to be single, not in a relationship right now, feeling like this part of my life, I need to get through it without attaching myself to someone or having someone attach themselves to me because I feel like it'll... It just isn't the right time and this part of my life, even because I'm doing different things with my time and I really don't have a lot of free time, I feel like it's just probably in everyone's best interest that I just carry on kind of on my own doing, <laughs> doing this, doing my work and at some point will be a better time. Yeah. So did it immediately speak to you? I, I pulled that from it, yes. Beautiful. Beautiful. So your card for the day. Okay. Okay. Gentle gardener. Be your own person. Be a conscious co-creator. The gentle gardener is visiting you at this moment in your life to remind you that your thoughts, feelings, and beliefs create the reality you experience. She is the embodiment of the energy within you that is sent out in the field of co-creation and ensures that all that you are is reflected in the world of form. Are you aware of your thoughts? What is their quality? Believe in limitless possibility and you will see miracles unfold. The gentle gardener guarantees the integrity of everything you send out into the world. Stay positive and expect a wondrous return. Your garden is abundant with beauty. I think you're the gentle gardener. Am I? Well, yeah, but we wouldn't be on this website right now if you didn't know how to find it and be a gentle gardener. So this one I feel a little more skeptical about. Like, yes, this this is useful. You picked all of these cards. I have nothing to do with <laughs> any coding or source code or I don't know any of that stuff. But So I'm both skeptical of it, but I also think it is relatable, of course. And that's yeah. why that's why this this works, because it's made relatable. You you help find this for me and, and show me that these things exist. And if I really think about it, I think it can be mm-hmm. helpful to me. I, I certainly don't think it hurts in any way to do this. I don't know that it's um, some amazing type of thing, but I do think it's useful. So and it's that's a the tool. Point of it. yes. It's a tool, essentially, it's a tool to, to help. Reflect. Yeah, yeah, and they make really great journal prompts. You know, in my opinion. And can you remind me what's your podcast called? People I Know Show. Yeah. So the people I know show, and with the people that you know and that you speak to, you kind of do co-create and make something beautiful like conscious together. Conscious co-creator. Yeah, I am very <laughs> conscious of everyone I put on and why I think they might be useful to me yeah. and to anyone that might listen. So, yes. Yeah. You, you bring this perspective that I'd never experienced before that... I, I think we all do. We all help one another. Absolutely. What is this website if someone wanted to to do this on their own? Um, I just typed in Oracle Cards Online, but... Colette Baron Raid. Colette Baron Reed.com. Reed. Yes. Okay. We, so I can, sh- maybe I make a link to that one as well. Sure. People want to try this for themselves and see who their gentle gardener is or whatever, <laughs> whatever card they get. Yeah. Okay. So I have a couple more topics I want to hit on here. Okay. And this is, this is one that you presented to me. I think within the same time frame as the first time that we looked at the Oracle cards mm. some months ago is you got me to, for a while, I've lost it since then, to say and and not but. Oh, that's, yes. So. I think so. Because I I think 
it's common for me and maybe for others to, when putting together a compound sentence, to like start a thought. So I don't know what what would the the thought be today? Like we could have, we could talk for hours and hours, but you have something else to do later. But you see, I say it's so naturally. It, we could talk for hours and hours. And we could take a break and come back to it later. So it's a different way of phrasing yes. that I think is more positive. And also, it it, it, yeah, it removes the, the possible negative connotation, the contradictory, the contrarian, which I'm a contrarian mm-hmm. naturally. But there's nothing wrong with, and there's nothing wrong with being contrarian. <laughs> um, I think the reason why I started rephrasing that is because it tells your subconscious mind what that everything is valid that you can do everything or whatever you want does that make sense it does i totally when we first had this conversation i think it was maybe april right i really got in the habit of saying and but i struggled because sometimes grammatically i feel like it doesn't flow and then in, in that time, I think I've kind of gotten away from it. But still, sometimes I use the word but and I think about you and I think about, oh, I could probably say this differently. Yeah. I mean, let's give an example of, um, of this. Let's let's say I want to I want to go out for dinner this week, but I have homework to do. How does it change? How does how do you receive it differently if I say I want to go out for dinner with you and I have homework to do? do? Does it feel different? It feels like you're not battling within yourself of making this choice. Yeah. So if you said I have homework to do and I'm going to find some time to go to dinner with you. That that, that does sound better than I'm going to go to dinner with you but I have homework. Yeah, right? It, it's it's, it's just, already kind of setting up some some aspect of it for not being authentic and and you're complete. changing you're changing your in your own minds like in your own perspective you're changing yourself and what your capacity is like I can do homework and I can go to dinner it's not one or the other you know maybe not even in verbal phrasing I feel like I'm doing more of this lately so I have. I have my my main job, which I don't speak of, haven't and maybe won't for some time speak of specifically on the podcast, although it's no huge secret. My second job is my Uber in my Lyft driving. And we met, this conversation exists because of Uber and us randomly coming across. I think it's totally random and coincidental. Maybe you think it was some sign from somebody. I don't know. I always tend to get along with people that travel. That's all I know. (laughs) <laughs> and you like to travel. <laughs> I do. So I've, I've been traveling a lot lately. Jealous. And I'm trying to work my, my hours at my main job, maintain the hours that I want to put into Uber and Lyft to make an average weekly income that I'm trying to do. And I have this podcast and I'm trying to do it all. And I feel like maybe if I'd listen to some other people's opinions... Someone might say it's too much, like you shouldn't do that. If you did that, you wouldn't have enough time. Or I feel like it's more of a negative thing. But for me, I just decide I'm going to do it all. I'm going to find a way. I sleep less than I should. Mm. And it's worked out so far. Right. And I just keep doing it and it's okay. And it's it's empowering to me to keep doing it. And as I'm, as I'm saying this, I'm, I'm trying to, and I'm having an easy time of just saying and. I'm not, if I put up the but, I feel like, I would be limiting myself and I wouldn't accomplish yeah. as much. Yeah. So in this way. It just feels more freeing. Like I just do it all. And I think it can all be done. And if when you limit your beliefs and say, if I do that, I can't do that. We can do that, but we can't do that. I feel like you're just selling yourself short of your potential in some way. So I think... I'm very happy that we. I brought up. I remember this and but thing. I'm gonna. I'm gonna, I'm gonna focus on myself. I, and then maybe it's a good reminder for you that you once told me this. Right. And right. also to anyone listening, as a challenge to you, try replay every time you want to say the word but, replace it with and in some way, and see how that affects you. I like your train of thought. 
that's the the personal growth part of this episode. One of the, the many things. One more thing, mm. and then we'll transition to the being wrong segment. Is you already spoke about you been doing some Facebook lives? I've done some of those as well. <gasps> yeah, and I, I feel like that that in this podcast, right? It's kind of a it was kind of a struggle, and I I think more practice will help. But putting putting myself out there, and so you're doing something similar right now. You, you're working on your your business and trying to get more people to recognize it and possibly you know come come work with you so you need to promote it so you got to put yourself out there and do it in a way that you feel like you're confident that you've done a good job of and it's not scripted and sometimes you don't know how people will react or how people will respond because people are also busy and they are you know quick to judge so I think for me, it's part of my own personal development to share my truths just as you are sharing yours and to letting people know different ways of, um, of thinking and different learn different tools of, that can help people on their own personal journey, for sure. But yes... Uh, I do Facebook lives. I've, I've done it uh, one week and now this is, I'm moving on to my second week and it is kind of daunting. It's not easy. I could tell you. It's not. And it's also useful. It's an opportunity. It's, it's amazing because it's been going on for a couple of years. I think you could have done that. And people, right. And a few people in my life do. My brother and sister do it quite a bit. And I see a few other people use it kind of frequently. It's a great way to get whatever you want seen on Facebook, for instance, seen because you get a notification, I think, every time, unless you tell your your settings otherwise, every time someone in your friends list goes live in some way, it'll notify your app or your website. So it becomes very out there for people. And I, I, when I've done mine, some people randomly that I don't talk to very often end up watching me and maybe they <laughs> click away because they're bored with it or busy with other things. They just want to see quickly, but it's, and it's, and it's there to, 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 have, to really create an opportunity that might not be there otherwise. Isn't that kind of crazy? Because, um, before I, you know, I remember a lot of people want to protect their privacy uh, at least online. And, and now I notice the trend that people are becoming a lot more open to sharing sharing themselves, sharing their opinions and what they have to say, and also their perspective. That's essentially part of social media, right? It is. We all are our own news organization, in a sense. We're, we're <laughs> oftentimes a one-person journalist team, and we can post our photos or videos or write whatever we want. And some people have great influence. And other people, I think, don't do a great job of it and it becomes very clear i think to someone just casually observing others who's effective who's not and those that are effective have a a following that grows and grows and grows and those that don't you see like no or one like on some of their stuff sometimes and a lot of times with political stuff i feel like that that's what happens if it's especially if it's not well well <laughs> if it's not well researched or well presented it's like eh, i'll move on from this and look at something else right right that's but it's mm. and it's so i'm gonna keep correcting myself on the air and it's 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 there and some of us and i'm attempting now and you're attempting to get better at it and i think anyone anyone has an opportunity if they feel like they have something to say there are two different types of people one you know one 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 would be the fixed learners and that are not willing to grow and to want to keep things, want to learn and move through the world in a certain way without opening their mind. And then there's a growth mindset that even though if you fail, you can keep trying and getting better at it and reflect (laughs) on uh, yourself and how you could make things and improve your yourself with whatever you're working on. And what I like about you, Kurt, is that you are growing. You are opening your mind. You are not afraid of uh, being wrong or, I mean, seeing a different perspective. I think that's really important. I try to because I, I feel like I keep improving as a person as I see yeah. the different perspectives. And even if 
I were to fail in some way. And when I see other people fail, fail maybe is a strong word. As I see this happen, I realize it's not a big deal. And then someone, they might come back with something different or better eventually. And I feel like we all have the opportunity to do that. Yeah. However, it's a scary thing sometimes to try something that we might fail at. We're just not used to it. It's fear. And I'm going to keep trying though, because I, I think it's important to my, my lifelong growth. Me too. Bina, let's transition to the being wrong segment. I, I explained this to you briefly. Okay. Something from your life, perhaps you've done a 180 on the way you think about something or over the long term, just have changed your thoughts. Do you have an example of something from your life recently or over the past many years that you can now say that you were wrong about? My perspective of homeless people have changed. I think a lot of people are really skeptical about giving homeless people money because, you know, they're going to buy drugs or um, misuse it in, in some shape or form, or we're continuing to perpetuate a culture where homeless people that are maybe um, able to work but choose not to are the way they are and they're not contributing to society. Whereas what I've learned really is that one, they don't necessarily have the resources. They need to know how to improve their lives or to get help. They might not, you know, be adequate when it comes to um, navigating like online or just like, you know, in the yellow pages that still exists, like how to find homeless shelters or how to get connected to, um, you know, finding support through through mental health or if their um, environment and the people that they are surrounded with can necessarily help raise them to that level of getting help. Also, um, yeah, I feel a lot less judgmental and a lot more compassionate when it comes to the homeless because to be honest i mean i'm i feel really lucky to have a roof over my head and to have people that care about me um and that can provide for me if if i were ever in in that case and also i do pride myself in my ability to problem solve and i feel like um with people that are homeless we could be a little less judgmental, you know? Um, if we do give money, I, I feel like for whatever reason, for what they choose to use it for, it would be um, so that they could survive. And, um, you know, with with that in mind, I would encourage you to, to maybe try to get to know someone or just, even look at them and even acknowledge them and say hi and just talk to them rather than ignore them. I don't feel like they are too threatening, uh, in my opinion. I feel like um, they that you could you could learn something from them, you know, and whether it's providing food or maybe a Target gift card or, you know, if you're you are afraid of how the money is going to be used. Sure. Like it's just it's. It doesn't hurt. It really doesn't because your life might be a lot better off than than theirs is and you could actually make their day and change the way they, they think about themselves or um, the way they think about other people. I think that's a really good, a good being wrong topic. I, my opinions change. I, I'm still trying to develop where it, it will go, but I, and I do give money occasionally to people maybe not someone standing on the the street corner i still i have a hard time with that but if i if i'm walking downtown minneapolis for instance and someone comes up to me with a story that may be totally fabricated may be legit i have on times given money knowing that regardless regardless of why they're in that situation i feel like my life is in such a better place than there seems to be so if giving them a little bit of money now 
helps push them a little bit further to get to the next day or something. I feel like I can handle that occasionally. Yeah. Certainly, though, there's a lot of people in that situation looking for asking for money. And if you do it every time, maybe some people give money every time. I don't feel like I can. And that's a struggle. I think there needs to be a greater a greater way to help these people. If, if, if we think that person should get a job, but that person doesn't have any of these means that we would have to get a job, they just they can't they can't figure it out for some reason, then maybe there needs to be a better support system that gets to them. There's yeah, there's a lot of lot of ways to improve this, but I've, I my thinking has changed. So thank you for sharing your your being wrong, Vina. Absolutely. And last segment, last opportunity, you're doing some good things in the world, trying to do some good <laughs> things in the world. If someone listening wants to find you or the things you're doing, how might they do that? Um, you could go to my Instagram, follow your whims, or you could visit Healing Clouds and you'll see me um, introducing different holistic health practitioners and um introducing people to new tips and tools to take care of themselves, to empower their health, their, um, you know, their, their well being and in, in their journey. All of these things that we mentioned, including this right now, I'll put in the show notes that should be available <laughs> on the podcast, anywhere you're listening to the podcast or on the people I know show.com website. Vina Chalice, thank you for the conversation today. Thank you very much, Kurt. Thank you for listening to People I Know Show. I have two requests for you as a listener, especially if you enjoy the program. One is you can rate and review People I Know Show on Apple Podcasts or whichever app or website you use to listen. The other thing you can do is talk about it, share it, tell somebody you know, share it on Facebook or on Twitter or just word of mouth, whatever means you think is most effective from you. This episode dropped on Friday, and that'll be the method I continue to attempt to do with a new episode being available each and every Friday. Thanks for listening to People I Know Show.